Today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy 8. I want to not just preach the New Testament. Folks, the Old Testament is good stuff, all right? Uh, there are people that say that we don't need to teach uh, the Old Testament, but I strongly disagree with that. Uh, the Ten Commandments are in it, and many, many other great things. And uh, folks, it's life lessons. Uh, today is a life lesson sermon. Uh, last week, uh, we thank God for the response. Uh, the message was, do not worry. And uh, when we came to invitation time, there was a flood of people coming to the altar to lay their worries on the altar and leave them there. Uh, so we praise God for what he is doing. If you have a bulletin, want to follow along with us, uh, there's an outline in the bulletin. Remember, just one word is the title to today. And I'm pretty sure you can remember that, all right? Number one, remember the test. Remember the test. Folks, there are going to be tests in life. There are going to be challenges in life. It's not all roses when you get saved. Even if you look at the Apostle Paul and Peter and others, folks, uh, they went through trials in life and tribulations. They experienced many things that tested their faith. And I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, the faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So we need these things in our lives. We don't like the test. All right, when I was in school, I was not a fan of tests. But I'm telling you, we have the answers to our test in the Word of God. And so we see, remember the test, remember the blessings. The blessings. You know, sometimes we dwell on the negative things so many times that we don't even think of the blessings of God. And then the third thing, remember the Lord. Folks, it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the Holy Spirit. It's about the Trinity, God the Father who created everything. God and Jesus the Son who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for your sins and for mine and is sitting at the right hand of God. And it's about the Holy Spirit, which came in Acts chapter 2. And folks, it's been here. We sense the Holy Spirit in our services. And God, we, get, we give God the glory for everything that happens. Man cannot save anyone. Man, I'm telling you, are just instruments. We are just servants of God. It is God who saves. It is God who convicts. It is God who gives us eternal life. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Every commandment which I command you, and remember Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, and uh, he, he was, you know, the leader. He was, you know, everyone looked to. Uh, God used him, and miracles were happening. But if you remember at Kadesh Barnea, they made a huge mistake. And by the way, the majority is not always right. Okay? The vote was 10 to 2, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because they did not trust God, because they did not believe God, because they listened to other people rather than listening to spirit-filled God leaders. And Moses was certainly one of those. Uh, every commandment which I command you today, you must uh, be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which I swore to your fathers. He told them to go into the land. They could have went into the land, but they chose not to. And you shall remember. Four times in this chapter, you will see the word remember. Four times in this chapter, you will see the words, do not forget. Why do we repeat things? Why do we say things over and over again? Because we want to do it the way God tells us to do it. It's like instructing a kid. There's not a lot of, you know, seven and eight-year-olds that you could tell them one time and it happens. 
You keep telling them, and you keep telling them, and you keep telling them. So eight times the same thought is in this scripture. And you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. And folks, you have to understand, God gives us tests, the devil gives us temptations. And there is a difference. There is a difference. God is giving you tests to help you, to help you look towards Him, to help you realize how strong God is, to help grow you in character, to help you through challenging times so that you can help others during challenging times. You can't avoid tests. You can't avoid it. They happen. It's life. But how you respond to those tests is huge in your Christian walk. Matter of fact, to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. The Bible tells us out of the heart, issues of life come from the heart. And I realize Jesus comes into our heart, but I'm telling you, Satan likes to mess with your head. He likes to mess with you. Folks, we, when we surrender our heart to God, it means that we shall love the Lord with all our soul, of all our mind, with all our heart, with all our body, everything, our whole total being. We are surrendering to God. Hold your finger there and go to Romans 5. Paul explains this in a wonderful way in Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we are saved. Justification, Jesus saved us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm always amazed at people that make this statement to people that have lost loved ones. I can't believe you're not upset about this. And do you know what most of them say? Hey, I know where they are. We can have the peace of God even in the times of death. God through our Lord, Je we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, through whom we have access by faith and to this grace which we stand and rejoice in hope and glory of God. What's the joy? The joy is that person's not suffering anymore. The joy is that person's not battling cancer anymore. The joy is, I know where they at, they're at. Even the phrase, we lost, and you fill in. We hadn't lost them. We know right where they're at. If they're Christians, they're in heaven. And we need to rejoice. Verse 3, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. That is trials, folks. That is test in our lives, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. I heard a man say one time, what won't kill you will make you stronger. Oh folks, God walks through those problems and tests with us. Every answer, I said it earlier, to every test in life can be found in the Word of God. You are not without the answer, but you have to read the book to find the answer. And it says, knowing that tribulation per, uh, produces perseverance and perseverance character. Folks, if there's something our world is lacking today, it's character. Man, everybody, it seems to me, lies. We have liars, 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 pants on fires. I just can't believe people can look in your face and lie to you, and you know they're lying in what they're saying. Folks, character is doing what is right, whether anybody sees it or not. Character is choosing the God way. Character is following the Word of God. And here's what I found out. During my times of testing, I depend on God more. I pray more. I look to His Word more. We all need character. And tests help us with that. And character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
Let me tell you something, and I know you know this, but let me tell you this. There is not a time in your life that God doesn't love you as much as he loved you the day he saved you. God's love never wavers. There are times in life, even with me, that I think God's up there just going, oh, man. We all mess up, folks. We all make wrong choices. But God's love never changes. I'm amazed at people that run from God, quit going to church, quit reading their Bible, quit praying when a tragedy or a test comes into their life. Folks, they need to run to God. God has the answer to every question. Back in our text, Deuteronomy 3, or 8, 3. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. What did he do? He fed them. Every morning they had bread. And it says here that he may no, might make you know that men, not, men shall not live by bread alone. And again, I think there's two things here that he's talking about. All right, just bread in a diet is probably, you go to your doctor and he's going to say, that's not all that you need to eat. But listen, if God gives it, that will do. God will take care of you in bread only if God is in it, folks. And the second thing is, he is all, also talking about the bread of life. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Word of God. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Shall be filled. But man lives by every word. There it is that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. What is the Bible? It's God's gift to us. What is the Bible? It's God's holy word. What is the Bible? It's truth off the lips of God in Jesus Christ. We cannot live without food. But folks, there are Christians starving to death spiritually because they do not spend time in the Word of God. Look at verse 4. Your garments did not wear out on you. I don't know why, but this verse stuck out for me. I got to thinking, 40 years, 40 years they were wondering. The shoes that they wore, same shoes, same clothes. How did that happen? Folks, God can do anything. If their shoes grew, their clothes grew. It has, I had never thought about this till I started reading. There wasn't replacements. He says, I will take care of you. What you have on is sufficient. Nor did your foot swell these 40 years. He left them where they all could walk. Why? Because they chose something other than God's will for their life. You should know in your heart, look at verse 5, that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. And again, folks, it's going to the woodshed with God. I went to the woodshed. My dad had a woodshed. And it wasn't often because he worked all the time. But when we went, it wasn't a pleasant experience. All right? I am telling you, there are spankings and there are whoopings. And he whooped me. And, and really, uh, my, my sister said, he didn't whoop you enough. <laughs> what was my dad trying to do? Prove he was stronger than me? No, not at all. He was trying to save my soul. From hell. Say what? Folks, the Bible says the, the proper spankings drives foolishness from the heart of a child. When my dad says, get to the shed, I knew what was coming. And I, I, I am so glad my mother said this a thousand or more times. Wait till your dad gets home. Wait till your dad gets home. And I would go to bed at 7 o'clock at night <laughs> to avoid, wait till your dad gets home. 
My dad didn't whoop me because he hated me. He whooped me because he loved me. All right? And the same thing is true with God. God's love never changes, folks. But chastening is discipline from the Lord. Hold your finger there and go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5 says, and, and you have forgotten, there's our word, an exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord love, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receives. All right? He's doing it for your good. He's doing it to help you learn a lesson. To learn a lesson. Matter of fact, those who forget the past are likely to repeat it. Those who forget the past are likely to repeat it. Look at verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Do you know, uh, being chastened by God, being disciplined by God, means that you are saved. It should give you the assurance of your salvation. As much as we don't like the chastening of God, it is for our good. And listen to me, for His glory. He wants you to walk right and talk right and do right and act right and be right. Why? For his glory. Verse 8, but if you are without chastening, of which you all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If he does not correct you, if you think you get away with it every time, I would check my salvation if I were you. That's what illegitimate is, folks. Not one of his. Then skip down to verse 11. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Oh, folks, nobody likes to be chastened. But I am telling you, God has every right to do it, and he's doing it for our good. Remember the test. Number two, remember the blessings. Verse six, therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks and of waters and of fountains and of springs that flow out of the uh, out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive oil and honey. What was he taking him to? Folks, he's, they, he wanted to take them to a place earlier, you know, where they rejected going in. Their grapes were the size of our watermelons. Water was in abundance. Fruit was amazing. That's why it's called the promised land. Folks, God made this covenant with Abram back in Genesis 12. Go with me to Genesis 12. I want to remind you of what God said. It's only three verses, but there is great teaching in these verses. Genesis 12.1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know for sure how he was going to get there. there he, he didn't give, God didn't give him a map. He said, gather your stuff and start walking. I'm telling you, I am amazed at the faith of people in the Old Testament. They had faith that folks we don't have. They trusted God. They trusted God and not everything. And I know they messed up. And I know some of the prophets did not do right. Some of the kings did not do right. But just to take your family and go by faith, they had to believe in a coming Messiah. They had no clue who Jesus was. But by faith, they trusted God. And it says, I will make you a great nation. 
I will bless you. Listen to me, folks. We are blessed to live in the United States of America. We are blessed. We ought to thank God every day for the freedoms that we have. Nobody outside, our, you know, us, uh, outside of us here are guarding our doors. There's nobody telling me what to preach. There's nobody telling us whether we can uh, have a Bible and possess a Bible. Folks, we live in a free land, and you need to thank God for that. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Folks, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curse you. What is he saying? You stay in my will. You do my commandments, and I'm telling you, you will be blessed. I will protect you. I will take care of you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Folks, I do not care what everybody else is doing, but I pray to God we will stand with God's people, and God's people, I'm telling you, is Israel. It is Israel. Folks, we need to pray for Israel. And I know there's a lot of stuff out there. I'm not getting into the politics of things. You've heard me for 20 years not be political up here. You know what we need more of? We need people being biblical up here. What is God saying? What does God's Word say? And then we obey. So we see the blessings of God. And even at that, folks, I'm telling you, he made this promise to Abram, and then he said it in the, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Hebrews 11. Verse 8. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham. It was Abram went to Abraham when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive this inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him on the same promise. Folks, if God promises something, he will do it. You can bank on his word. For he waited for the city which has foundations, who builders and makers is God. Oh, folks, we may lose a battle down here or two. We will make some dumb choices down here and be disciplined. But folks, what keeps me going is knowing that one day we will be in heaven. We will be with God. And folks, I tell you, that first 60 seconds in heaven is going to be amazing. We talked about Revelation for a long time, 15 months, I believe. And God, I, I, folks, I believe God's promises. When we die, as Christian, we will spend an eternity with God. Why? Because His Word says so. And then it says in verse 9, back in our text, in a land which you will eat bread without uh, a scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of the hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given us. Oh, folks, we are so blessed as God's children. We really are rich. You know, and I know when we say rich, we associate that with money. But I tell you what, folks, there's one thing about money I can promise you. It won't guarantee you happiness. Okay? It won't. We could be poor. And even, even with my, uh, you know, my descendants, I notice, you know, I, I worked almost 10 years down in Mexico. And there were two things about the Mexicans. Okay? And number one, they were family-oriented. Number two, they were content with what they had. They were happy. 
They worked. I watched them. I watched them, and they worked. And folks, I am telling you, we should be happy and content with, with what God gives us. So he says, remember the tests, remember the blessings, and remember the Lord. Look at verse 11. Beware that you do not forget, there's that phrase, the Lord your God, by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You know, sometimes we, and, and what we do is uh, we you know, seem to prosper. We seem to have plenty. And sometimes, folks, we even take that for granted. Everything you have is a gift from God. We should not, we should not, we should realize where it comes from. We shouldn't take advantage of that. We shouldn't try to do things on our own. We shouldn't, he, he said twice in this scripture, to be humble. We don't need to be proud. We don't need, need to show things off. And folks, it's not a sin to have money. It's your attitude towards that money. It's what you do with that money that we have to realize God has given all of this to us. Verse uh, 15, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which fiery serpents and scorpions, thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water uh, for you out of a flinty rock. Folks, our God can do anything, anything. They saw what God did. You know, God parted the sea. I know, uh, you know, Moses was there, you know, and it was his staff. But I am telling you, it was God that saved the children of Israel, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. Folks, God's not finished with us. God's still working on us. We have a job to do. All right, folks, there, there's not retirement in Christianity. You don't get to a certain age and say, well, I don't have to go to church anymore. I don't have to give anymore. I don't have to witness anymore. Folks, we of all people, senior adults, and I am one of you, ought to be thanking God for what we have. I'm not depending on man for my income, folks. It is God. It is God. And it says, then you say in your heart, my, uh, my power and uh, the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And God is just saying, you better not do that. You better not. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. It is, and, and he may establish your covenant, which he's for to your fathers as this day. Folks, the same Bible, the same uh, scripture that Moses has written is here for us today. It's never outdated, okay? It's always up to date. It's always applicable to anyone who will read it. And it shall be, if by any means you forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I will testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord our God. What is he saying? I am telling you all through the book of Deuteronomy, he is telling that God's children Obey the commandments of God. Obey the commandments of God. And you will prosper. I close with this, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1, remember the Lord. Verse 5, men, I love this. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. 
I will not leave or forsake you. Isn't it neat? That is a direct quote of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. What is right for the Old Testament is right for the New Testament also. There is never a time in your life that God is not with you. There is never a time in your life that God forsakes you. We are the ones that move. We are the ones that forget. God is the same, the Bible tells us, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance to the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe and do according to uh, the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. See, the world and society, you know, they, they keep talking about this new normal. And I got news for them. It is not normal. Sin is not normal to a Christian. We don't need to buy their stories and their lies. We need to follow the word of God and obey it with our heart, mind, soul, and bodies. Verse 8, this, look, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, look at this, you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. You want to succeed in life? Obey God. Follow his commandments. Do the right thing. God will take care of you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Folks, we should not be afraid of anything. Anything. Nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a promise. What a promise from God. I pray today that you will take some time today and remember. I want to challenge you also sometime this week to get a piece of paper and get a pen out and write down every promise that God has given you, every blessing that God has given you. It's not going to be a five-minute deal, folks. Write them down, and then pray and thank God for His promises. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, there is a promise in the Word of God. If you will believe, if you will put your faith and trust in Christ, you will be saved. Oh, the greatest gift I have ever received is the gift of salvation. And you know the neat thing about salvation? It never expires. It's a guarantee. Nobody can take that from you. I pray that if you don't have the assurance of salvation, that you will come and you will give your heart and your life to Jesus. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you that we can remember. God, I thank you that you are God of all the days. And God, I truly believe even we as Americans don't give you enough credit. God, we owe you everything. We can never pay you for what you have given us. God, I know it's a free gift. I know it's grace. But God, I pray that we would not be a disgrace to grace. God, I pray uh, if there's Christians here that need to rededicate their life to Christ, if there's folks here that need to come in these prayer altars and just do business with you, God, if some need to follow the Lord in baptism or make their profession of faith public, and God, I pray especially for those who don't know you and have the assurance of salvation. God, I pray they would come. God, I pray they would just look on either side of them and say, hey, man, will you go with me? I need to be saved. So, God, thank you for your precious promises. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you in any way, would you come?